I think the exciting thing, if you're a small business, and this is going to sound sort of ridiculously simple, but is to love what you love. So rather than finding someone and trying to make them love you and trying to know enough about them to make them love you, tell the story of what you love and let the machine find them. And maybe they're hard to find and maybe they're easy to find, but be who you are. I think the bar for, for the storytelling about what you love is high, so you can't imitate somebody else and expect to make it. But the technology to make things from nothing is, is incredible. And so where does that take you and what does that let you make and what story does that let you tell? Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if it were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and you are listening to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Here's today's question What's the future of storytelling? Now, before you try and answer that question, I just I want you to consider a few facts. Fact number one, AI software can now generate video content on demand. And in one year's time, you will be able to generate an entire movie based on just a few simple lines of text. Fact two, short story platforms, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, have now hit a staggering 30 billion views a day. That's 30 billion views of short stories. At the same time, in 2021, the streamers, Netflix, Amazon, Stan, the ones that are responsible for long-form stories, released more than 1,800 original series. Now, that is a staggering 90% increase since just 2017. So what on earth you may ask, what does any of that have to do with the future of story? Today, once again, to help me answer that question and many more, is Global Director of Creative Works at Google, the brilliant Ben Jones. Now, for those of you who don't know Ben yet, you are in for a feast. Ben Jones is Creative Director at Google and also Head of Unskippable Labs. Unskippable Labs are a team within Google designated with the huge task of studying the 1 billion hours of video that are viewed on YouTube every single day. Their mission, very simple, to work out exactly what makes us press or not press the skip button. You know the skip button at the bottom right hand corner of the screen when you watch a video on YouTube? Their job is to decode in real time the stories that attract and hold our attention. Therefore, the stories where we do not press skip looking at the 122 million visitors every single day, huge amounts of data. So essentially, all they look at is what makes a story unskippable. This is Ben's fourth time on the podcast, however, and I probably do say this every time, this is by far my favorite conversation. This feels like accumulation of all of Ben's predictions about the future of storytelling since we first met four years ago each one coming rapidly and simultaneously to life, you know, in some ways, probably far too rapidly. Today, we dive under the surface of the digital storytelling iceberg, including topics like how COVID reset all our patterns when it comes to the who, what, where, and how long of the stories we love to consume and all the patterns that he's watching emerge right now. The role of story length when it comes to engagement, and you know, this one, this one hit me hard, including why three minute ads are now way more powerful than 30 second ads. And 30 seconds has been the, the bedrock of the traditional video ad length for goodness knows how long. And why the most successful ad he has ever seen ran for four hours. We talk about why microcultures are now more powerful than demographics, i.e. why what you love is now a better indicator of engagement than who you are. We unpack the third era of marketing, an era made up of big stories and invitations. And finally, and unexpectedly, 
we discuss his experience in navigating one of the hardest chapters of his life and how a simple poem that he wrote went on to become a blueprint that kept him and eventually many other people steadily moving forwards. There are so many websites, links, examples mentioned in this conversation. We've tried to put as many as we can in the show notes, hop on, have a look. But believe me, there is more than enough fascinating rabbit holes to keep you going until next year if you are a storytelling nerd. For me, the most powerful thing that I got from Ben was probably just how hungry we are for stories. For content that's designed to invite, engage and inspire us rather than continually overwhelm and interrupt us, which, as we all know, is the traditional style of advertising. In Ben's words, Netflix put $10 billion into content last year. If you could buy all the attention that you needed, don't you think they would have bought it? And I think that's really worth considering for a minute. It's it's a shift in our mindset as storytellers from focusing on paid interruption to a series of thoughtful invitations. And that one shift, I believe, is probably the very definition of the future of storytelling. For those of you who want to take your own storytelling or your own journey of influence to the next level, don't forget, hop on my website. I know I say it every time, but but believe me, it's worth it. Hop on my website or the show notes and download the latest version of my ebook, The Influencer Code. It covers the seven areas and the seven core questions that I have found hands down to be the most useful when it comes to fast tracking your own level of influence. Just pop in your email address and it will be in your inbox in the time it takes to pour a cup of tea. On that note, sit back, coffee up, caffeine up, cycle on and once again, for the fourth time, enjoy the predictive storytelling genius of Ben Jones. Welcome back to the podcast, Ben Jones. This is what this is fourth time we just discovered. We have done every location on the planet. We've done every weather condition on the, on the planet. I feel I feel bad that it's sort of an ordinary day here in New York City. Like it's a little gray and rainy, but there is not a typhoon or you know a superstorm or some something. It's just a real ordinary day. The first time, wasn't it? It was a blizzard in Boston. I remember you literally couldn't leave your front door. I was, um, I, was it Tahiti? I was somewhere in the middle of a, of a massive storm. And we made that happen. I don't know how. I don't know how the Wi-Fi lasted long enough to make that happen. But today we're here, relatively normal day in Sydney, relatively normal day in New York. So no weather distraction. That's a good place to start. Well, I'm going to, I want to kick off the, the way that I usually kick off and you would know this question well enough by now, which is if there's, is there one idea, one idea that's really kind of captured your attention right now, that's influencing your thinking that just won't leave you alone. So I, like most of the rest of the world, I, I think it is very interested in the world of generative AI and what it means. And the particular piece of it for me is what happens when the gap between imagination and expression shrinks to nothing? What do we make and what do we consume and what do we broadcast? And so that that gap is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. And there are all kinds of problems on, on either side of it in terms of how we imagine things and what we imagine and the way these technologies are surfacing bad human tendencies and the, and the, intellectual property rights that are being scraped and sucked into these generative engines and, and so on. Um, but I'm very interested in, in what happens when that, when that gap between what I can imagine and what I can express is so, is so small. So just walk me through that tangibly. Like, I love the, I love the feel of what you're saying The when the gap between what I can imagine and what I can express shrinks to nothing. What does that look like? Is it that I, I'm going to completely make this up. Is it that I, I have a thought, I feed that thought very briefly into an AI generative service, you know, chat GPT, copy AI, there's a whole bunch of them coming up and it produces, you know, the ultimate expression of what I'm thinking in, you know, less than a second. Is that the world? Mm-hmm that you're thinking of? 
So everyone is everyone is very focused on the tech side. I I'm interested in the image and video side. Tech side's very interesting, but as a writer, I think I probably am sort of snobbish about the quality of what comes out and and the gaps that are there. It's sort of a approximation of mediocre thinking at scale. Um, but for example, uh, type into Mid Journey uh, Wes Anderson Star Wars. And you get a vision of Star Wars and the characters, the droids and the stormtroopers done in an artistic vision that matches Wes Anderson. So quirky and his palette and his view or or Jodorowsky, who's a Chilean filmmaker and has a wild imagination and people do Jodorowsky's Tron. And so you see these incredible visions that look like film stills from a movie that never got made. And so that ability to synthesize these entertainment properties and visions of specific directors in a way that feels real, that's very captivating for me. And it manifests as brands, people, people plug in brand collaborations. So you plug in, uh, you know, you plug in, um, you plug in Nike and Yaya Kusama, and you get these incredible, beautiful things you never would have imagined shoes that don't look like they fit, but also you want to print out in that minute. And so that combination is incredible to me because it opens up how you think about what brands can be and what movies can be. And, and it's a sentence that you type in in text and it's there. Um, but the interesting piece of that is, you know, you type in Wes Anderson, Star Wars is amazing, but it isn't generating a new thing. It's generating a Wes Anderson's vision of Star Wars, both of which things exist. And in the synthesis, there's something magical and it feels new but it doesn't give you a new Wes Anderson and it doesn't give you a new Star Wars. And so how are you using these tools that then can immediately let you see all of these worlds and create them and generate them? I saw another, another example and it was, it was 1970s Polaroids of Marvel superheroes. Uh, and so it's Aquaman, but he's at a dive bar and he's got a handlebar mustache and a, you know, tight bowling shirt. I mean, and they're incredible. They're incredible. And it just, and you just look like you found it. it it's people publish them. You just, uh, Mid Journey is, is one and, and Dolly is one and, and Google has, has their own versions of them. But again, you type in the words and out comes this vision and you can imitate camera styles and artist styles and, and genres and decades and so on. Uh, and so you can type in any subject and you can put them in any world at any time, manifest in any way, shot through a certain camera or Polaroid slideshow or black and white. And, and so does the, is the kind of the natural flow on of that, I'm just trying to imagine it, you know, five years from now that we'll, we can take our favorite movie and go, you know what, I love this movie, but I'm really loving this particular director right now. Let me combine the two things together. For, for, I want this movie my personal experience of this movie to be through this lens, this particular lens. You, you, that, that is not five years away, that, that may be a year and a half away. And so now imagine, you know, oh, I love Casablanca, but I want it as a space opera. And, you know, I want to have it directed by Inuritu and I want to have it starring, you know, X and Y. I want to have it starring Cate Blanchett because I love her and I want, Oh, let's say a young Patrick Stewart and recast, reset, re and then you watch it and you're like, yes, I like this, but more car chases uh, and, and, you know, whatever. And, and the pieces of those worlds can combine again, when whatever ways we can imagine with great rapidity. So it started with images and the images have gotten better and better and better. So now you can generate photorealistic images you're starting to be able to do video. So I can type in and a new video will get generated and they're weird and they don't really work and they're short, it takes a lot of processing power. Um, but the acceleration rate of those pieces is phenomenal. And so the first thing that we're doing with them is we're trying to do things that we would have done before just faster, right, better. And so I could have a storyboard artist who could generate Wes Anderson Star Wars for me, and it would take you know a couple of days and be pretty good, and maybe I'd end up in the same kind of space. But the fact that I can do it in eight seconds means that I can generate 30 or 40 or 50 of those, and I'm not using a storyboard artist. And so, so again, I'm still doing a thing I did before just faster and faster. What's interesting for me is what things are we making that we're not seeing, and what things are we not imagining? I, I, the example was shared with me, which I think is a very good one, is email. Like when we first started using email, 
you know, we would type in, dear Julie, comma, I am, this is, the weather is, you know, sincerely, cheers, Ben. We were imitating a letter form that existed before, and now email is this much more fluid notification conversational system that doesn't resemble a physical letter. Um, it has lost that form and it's become something new. What happens when this becomes something new? Then what, what will it be and what will we use it for? What's your, so many questions I have here around creative boundaries, you know, your, your Wes Anderson, for example, do you, do you want your style to become an algorithm that you, you know, you no longer have any kind of say or control over that becomes a filter over other people's experiences that's associated with your name? But that aside for a second, what, what do you see? You, <laughs> because that feels like a can of worms, right? Um, but what do you see? As you said, what, what do you see this becoming? What do you see the, the practical, tangible experience of this as it will be in our lifetime a year from now, two years from now? I think the interesting thing that we've seen over the last 18 months is an unbelievable hunger for stories that goes deeper and farther and has more strange forms than we ever imagined. If you look at, if you look at the world of streaming and CTV and long form, like this entire world of entertainment has exploded. The, the entire global TV and show industry has essentially doubled in size since 2017. Doubled in size. Like all the movie studios doubled again in terms of their volume. Since of 2017. Yeah. Since 2017 at plus 90%. Wow. 90% additional stories created in what is that? I'm going to add up the years. Six years. Yeah. I, so shows, movies, et cetera, et cetera. That volume has, has gone up 90% in the last five, six years. So that whole world exploded. And yet at the same time, the short video TikTok for us shorts world has exploded. We're, we're at 50 billion views a day in shorts. And so if we wanted one of those things or the other of those things, then maybe you would see that growth. Maybe if we were like, oh, all we want is these beautiful rich stories on the large wall. Okay, maybe we would have doubled the entire music and in the entertainment industry, but we don't. We want that and the short world. And it's not that the old people are choosing the long form and the young people are choosing the shorts. Young people are choosing the shorts to get to long. And so we're just, we're just barely beginning to understand the depth and richness of this hunger for stories that people have. And it's filling all kinds of uh, proportions of our day that it never did before. So that's one, we're coming into this space with incredible hunger. So what do I see coming out of these technologies if I think they're shaped in the way that I hope that they are? that we have these wild and fantastical worlds that we enjoy inhabiting and we build together in participatory ways and that, and that tune in around us in ways that I think are, are unpredictable now. Uh, and I'll give, you, I'll give you one example. I think maybe two years ago or three years ago, we had this idea that you know I have a sort of fixed identity. I'm who I am. And so if I have a world that tunes in around me, that world is relatively stable, right? That I'm uh, it's me and my friends and my social graph is sort of a the rock center and we have a world that, that forms around us. But what we see now, particularly from Gen Z, is that the folks in Gen Z are putting themselves in these environments. And when they do, they're creating these kind of provisional identities that fit that environment and a different one for this environment and a different one for that environment. So I'm a different person on Instagram than I am on Discord, than I am on YouTube, than I am on, on, on Roblox or, or Minecraft or Fortnite. And they're very comfortable having five or six different identities that are distinct and changing those identities or having two or three that show up in different sorts of ways. And so they sort of inhabit that identity and come out and they expect that world to tune into that version of their identity. They don't want the world consistently to be who they are. They wanna be one person here, a different person there. And so there are all of these sort of provisional communities and the, they're coming together, these tribes that sort of grow up and disappear and grow up and disappear and people join them and leave them. Uh, and, you know, again, so imagine the hunger and then imagine this range of identities that are provisional and the expectations for relevance. The only way that those things are gonna work is with these incredible generative tools that are gonna build worlds around provisional identities at the rate and, with the complexity and with the relevance that people are interested in. 
It actually brings me to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, which was the rise of kind of exactly what you're talking about, almost like microcultures, small tribal subcultures, where you had this amazing line, which was, um, it used to be that we loved what our friends loved. Now we are friends with people who love what we love. And, you know, if you think about one of, one of the incredible advances that have happened over the past kind of five to 10 years is that suddenly we can target. We have this used to be mass broadcast on TV, one message fits all. Now we have this increasingly sophisticated ability to target our messaging. But until now, it's kind of been almost by demographic, you know, women who earn between this and this, who potentially live in this town, who have two children. And that in itself is a fantastical change from one size fits all. But now we have this whole other iteration that you were talking about, which is the ability to be able to target and build worlds around subcultures, which is, you know, for people who love this particular thing in this particular way and who behave this particular way around that topic. How, how does the stories, how do the stories we tell shift between those kind of subcultures? Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting piece of that is, is to imagine that they, are, that they are potentially unstable. So again, so you start with demographic, now go a layer deeper and you say, well, here's a person and they are you know, deeply interested in music or they are a beauty maven or they, are, you know, they, they, they love this particular kind of artwork. And we're like, oh, now we have a, you know, a layer of identity that goes deeper. And so we can build stories around that, right? When we look at folks on YouTube, the average person is engaging in 14 or 15 different categories of content. So they aren't a music or a movie or a beauty or a et cetera, et cetera. They are a music and a beauty and a movie and they're into industrial ASMR from East Germany and they're interested in this crazy musical subgenre. And so again, the, 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 the weirdness of the depth of our hunger for different types of content is remarkable. I had a fascinating conversation today with a, with a, with a CMO and she said, uh, I, so I got these rock polishing videos in my feed. What, why would I, who targeted me? I've never searched on a rock polishing video. I've never expressed any interest and it came up in my feed and I watched it. And now I get all these rock polishing videos. And so we had a brainstorm like, okay, let's reverse engineer the algorithm. You never looked at rock polishing, but why might that have surfaced in clusters of people who overlap with you in some ways? Well, number one, I think that you're interested in aesthetics. So, okay, aesthetics. And you may be interested in process. And so the idea of rock polishing is a process of getting to beautiful outcomes. And you may be interested in sort of industrial ASMR, like those kind of videos are very soothing. And so from a set of signals that you didn't express that you have sort of a glancing relationship to is an aggregate picture of a thing that you didn't know that is interesting to you. And so you're, you get a rock polishing video and you responded to it. And so you can see that like, oh, we went from a demographic and things roughly aligned to a demographic and we hope you fit to a single interest that you have that we are hammering you on, even though you have all these other interests and they're not taken into account to this like, is there a level up from that where you're a little of this and a little of that and a little of this? So let me surface something to you. Maybe that is unexpected. You know, maybe that that you didn't ask for and you don't know, but it introduces you to a set of people who aren't your friends. They aren't things that your friends like, but you should be friends with them because they have the same interest in aesthetics and process and, and, and you know, a soothing uh, making of beauty. I want to just pull, like pull back on that for a second. You know, for those, for those who don't have the budgets, you know, let's just say that we're, you know, the, Massive organizations listening, big budgets, you know, to go to that level of depth and sophistication um, and detail orientation when it comes to building out mass campaigns. But if I'm just someone who's, you know, potentially a small business or a medium sized business, I have a finite budget when it comes to creating stories that I hope are going to cut through, creating stories that I hope are going to get the attention of the people I want to, to reach. What what can I take from this? Like what, you know, what, what should I be trying? There's this is stuff that I'm already doing. What should I just be dipping my toe into now to stay ahead of the game? 
I think the exciting thing, if you're a small business, and this is going to sound sort of ridiculously simple, but is to love what you love. So rather than finding someone and trying to make them love you and trying to know enough about them to make them love you, to love that thing that you love and and let it find people who are who are going to love it. Uh, and if you, again, as you know from, from our conversations, like we look at thousands of ads, thousands of top performing ads, and the mix of ads that show up at a global level that are top performing are all over the place. It's not all LVMH and not all Nestle and not all Nike. In fact, it's not even a majority of that. It's one of those. And you know, a small business and a weird individual creator who just has this dazzling style. And so, you know, love what you love and let the machine find who you need to reach. Because now the, the way that these tools work is you set the price that you want to pay and you set the outcome that you want. So I want to reach, you know, I want to get people to download my app and I want to pay a dollar for it. I don't care who they are. If they pay, if it costs me a dollar and they download, my business works. And so tell the story of what you love and let the machine find them. And maybe they're hard to find and maybe they're easy to find, but, but be who you are in a way that in this sort of, you know, very Catholic in the broadest sense world, um, there's a lot of space. Uh, there's a lot of space. I think the bar for, for the storytelling about what you love is high. So you can't imitate somebody else and expect to, to make it. But that's why I think that gap between imagination and expression shrinking is so interesting because you don't need a big budget and you don't need a film crew and you don't need you know you can make incredibly beautiful things by typing in you don't even need photoshop i mean at this stage again rights issues aside ethics issues aside those are big asides but the technology to make things from nothing is is incredible and so where does that take you and what does that let you make and what story does that let you tell do you have a, a couple of examples there for anyone who wants to look into kind of what's possible? Who's who's doing it well? Are there any kind of indie creators out there we would never have heard of that you can we can just go in and kind of sink ourselves into to understand who's who's just doing this incredibly well? Well, the first place that you should look is these communities. So go on to Discord, which is for those who don't know a, a service that that. Uh, people use to, to chat, they use it during games and so on. And it's a very vibrant community and search on mid journey and just see what people on discord are making with mid journey. Amazing, but will blow your mind. So one, uh, two, I think that there are a bunch of companies who are advancing these tools very quickly. Chat GPT being, I think very, very well recognized and the Bing chat GPT stuff is very interesting. If you haven't played with it, recommend that you do. Um, there's a company here in New York, very small, super talented called Runway. So Runway ML. And they are making just dazzling tools, really fun, interesting tools. They have a they have a tool where you can take a piece of artwork and it will generate around it the world. So it'll take the style and the cues in the scene and it will show you, you know, you take the girl in the pearl earring and it'll put the girl in the pearl earring in a room, in a house, on a street in a village and it just builds that world and it builds it coherently off of the palette that's there and the characters that's there and it, it it unites them. Or you can do the same thing with two paintings. So pick Starry Night and, and Edvard Munch's The Scream. How are these two worlds unified? And it will blend them so that the landscape and palettes come together and they sit as one item. So Runway ML, so super interesting stuff. Mm. I want to tap into something you, you, you said kind of a couple of minutes ago, which was um, production quality. Production quality matters less. And I know you and I have talked about this, I think, every single time that we've caught up because it's mattering less and less and less as time goes on. Um, that you don't need the budgets and you don't, it doesn't need to be, yes, you can make it beautiful and there are tools now to, to make things beautiful as we're discussing, but it doesn't need to be beautiful. It doesn't need to be highly produced. It doesn't even need to be, you know, word perfect. What are you noticing in terms of the kind of videos that are getting cut through right now on YouTube? Is it away from that high production quality and further and further towards the kind of nitty gritty behind the scenes? Here's me and my iPhone. Yeah, uh, well, so, uh, so some contradictory cross currents here. Number one, here's me on my iPhone. Uh, Apple has done a series of 20-minute, half-hour videos in 
uh, with amazing directors in China and India. So a Bollywood version and a sort of uh, almost fable, Chinese fable. They're spectacularly beautiful. They are as beautiful as any film and they're shot on an iPhone. And so shot on iPhone, find these movies that Apple has done. So let's just take the, you know, iPhone equals lower quality out for a second, chapter one. Uh, chapter two, the fastest growing screen for us is the is the large screen in your living room, CTV. And the expectations of what shows up on that screen is that it is higher production quality. Uh, so you can make a thing and you can get incredible mobile reach and engagement and that can be lower quality or it can be higher quality. But if you show up on the big screen, which now if you put it in sort of a, one of these engines of ours, it'll go both places and it'll find where it gets its reception. And if you're building a library of assets, which is again how these products are starting to work, it'll pull the landscape version that's high quality to the CTV screen and it'll pull the vertical shorts version to the short screen. And so rather than making an ad and hoping it goes the places, you're making a set of five or 10 or 15 ads in the library and you're letting this machine say which ad's gonna do better, where, and what does it look like? And so you think like, oh my God, what a headache. It's a huge problem for these people who have to make these ads until you think, except I'm coming up to a time where I can just type in a sentence or two sentences and it'll start to generate an ad for me. And I can pick the quality level and I can pick the orientation and feed these systems. So we're seeing that it's not rough and gritty. It is actually uh, both high and low quality and it varies by screen and we expect those screens to map where we are. Um, and the last piece I'll say here is we just did a specific piece of research as yet unreleased, so a, so a, so a sneak preview for your audience that the Gen Z audiences actually do enjoy high production value. So TikTok is exploding, but they like ads that look beautiful and they are looking for products in a way that is not aspirational but accessible. So maybe in the 80s where we wanted you know, BMWs and flashy suits and greed is good. Now the Gen Z folks want a thing that can fit in their lives, that they can afford now, but it looks beautiful. It looks nice. They want a higher production value. So they're not make TikToks, not ads. They are, they are, they appreciate that you took the time to take a thing that fits in their life and make it beautiful. And so they want a little gift. That's what they want ads to be, a little gift. Which is a totally different mind frame, right? Than the previous mind frame of an ad from a in my language, from an interruption model, which is, you know, I'm just going to see, see if I can interrupt you, which is a very old school traditional model of advertising. If I can interrupt you enough times, eventually you'll buy to a contribution model, which is, you know, as you beautifully put it, like a little gift. Here's, here's a little something for you just to pique your interest, just something that you might enjoy or find beautiful or find interesting. It's a very different headspace to come at it from. Let me give you an example of an ad we launched a couple of weeks ago. We launched an ad for the new Nissan Aria, which is a e their new EV. Uh, and we created a four hour ad for the Nissan. No, Aria. I'm going to just stop you. Four hours. A four hour. Four hours. Ad. So four twice hours. the length of your average movie. Correct. Correct. And, and so what would you imagine that we would put in a four hour ad? And before you answer, I will tell you in the last two and a half weeks, it has more than 3 million views and literally thousands of incredibly enthusiastic comments. People are like, this is the best that I've ever seen. The marketing team deserves a raise. I never would have thought I'd bought a Nissan and now it's on my list. I'm going to go test drive an Aria, like literally explicitly calling out that they love it and they love it as an ad and they believe it should be the future of advertising. So what is in that ad? Before I answer the question, and I will, um, I just want to rewind back four years to our first conversation because, you know, your journey, you know, from starting like unskippable labs with putting your own credit card on the line to, to see if somebody would watch a brick wall and how long they would watch a brick wall for, to, to now, you know, we've gone from that initial piece of curiosity. I just want to point this out. For things than we think, for more reasons than we know, and there are more ways to reach human beings than we can imagine to where this conversation that we're having now, which is for you, you've just made a four hour long ad. So I just want to highlight that for a second. That's an incredible leap and approving of your hypothesis. 
But, you know, coming back, all right, let me answer the question. What would I imagine? I would imagine probably only in the context of the world that I know, which is, is it an interview with the, with the creator? Is it the journey of the creation of the vehicle itself, which then dovetails into how it comes from, where it comes from, the origins of the materials to the lives and the loves of the people who, who use it? There you go. Anywhere close? Amazing. Uh, I would love to make that ad. Uh, it is not. It is not. It is. It, it captures a genre of content on YouTube called lo-fi, which are these sort of deep driven videos that people put on to keep them company. Lo-fi girl being the most famous of them. Lo-fi girl is a locked off shot of a girl who is studying and it has these sort of very mellow beats behind it. And people turn it on to help them concentrate and to have company while they study. So they use it to study and it's a sort of background noise. So Nissan made a lo-fi video. And so it is a it is a, a delicate animation of a young woman driving a Nissan Aria. So it's a shot, fixed shot essentially of the cockpit of the car. And there's a, you know, her hair is moving a little and she's tapping her finger a little bit, but she doesn't move, she doesn't change, doesn't get out of the car, it's just her driving. And in the background, you can see as she goes through the landscape, uh, sometimes night, sometimes day, it goes through the season. And there are all these little Easter eggs to Japanese culture. So there's a kaiju that comes up, a Godzilla that comes up and goes down, and all of these little signals of Japanese culture that are so important to the heritage of Nissan, and they are within the within the cockpit of the car also. And I so deep, I don't even know what they are, but people who are fans of Nissan and fans of Japanese culture in the comments are like, oh, that's the Datsun 210Z, like that's a, a piece of this, or that's this anime character. And the video is filled with all these little Easter eggs. And so it isn't intrusive to your point, it's a gift. And you turn it on and you let it run and you listen to it and it keeps you company. And maybe you notice the Easter eggs or maybe you just let it chill you out and, and hang out. And so it's not interruptive and it's not demanding your attention. It's sitting back and saying like, hey, just chill. And there's four hours of this amazing music and it's just there. And you can dip in and out and you can come back if you want and not read the comments or just go to the video whole... and read the comments. It is astonishing. You know, that goes back into the subcultures that we talked about, which is, you know, the finding these unique creative tribes that we didn't know existed or let, letting the algorithm find them. Lo-fi, who, who knew? I had no idea that there was a, a culture of human beings that were into a particular video type called lo-fi. I'm going to, I'm going to hundred percent. It's a huge one. It's a huge one. Lo-fi girl is huge. And there are all these. Uh, so, so, so then after you search lo-fi girl, search with me, study with me, clean with me. And it is a video that is designed to keep you company while you do a thing. Okay. So study with me, clean with me, cook with me. And again, it's a, it's a style of video that is a, a, an accompaniment for you. And you can, you can see the dove, like the future dovetail happening there which is, you know, with me combined with AI. So it's an interactive experience, clean with me, have a conversation with somebody while you're, while you're cleaning. So it's a, it's a video that creates as you go, I'm, I'm making up worlds now, but you can see. Well, so, but so good. Yeah. No, no, so no, no please. I've got no idea where I'm going. I that. was just going to say, so, ah, <laughs> so, so. If, if the Nissan ad is four hours long and is incredibly successful and positive, you can put a generative engine on that and make it infinite. Take the beats, shape the beats, have them go so that every time I tune in, it's in this range of beautiful, cool, tonally right, et cetera, et cetera, but it's always changing. It's never the same. And all the little Easter eggs, well, you know, if, if, if I can look up all of these Easter eggs of Japanese culture, then a machine can look them up and say, well, we have a kaiju and let's put cherry blossoms in and let's make a, let's make a, a heritage to Kabuki theater in the style of this and the palette of this. And, and we can tune into ambient data signals in the background. And so let's have it match real time the weather that's in where the Nissan headquarters are or maybe the weather where you are. So if it's raining, it's raining in the Nissan Aria world. Um, and so there's a, 
there is a mirroring and there's a resonance of your world that is in this world. And so I'm in New York and it's a gray, cold day. And, you know, there's a gray, cold day that I'm watching in the Aria, in the Aria infinite ad. And I tune in and it keeps me company and I feel like I can see my world and I can see it. And it's not trying to cut through. It's not trying to break into my world. It's, 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 it's welcoming me. Mm, goes back to the, the invitation versus interruption. The shift in mindset from interruption to to invitation. I want to just drill down in the length there because there was something that that I heard you say in one of the videos that you sent me prior to to getting together today, and that was the the, the thirty second story, which, as you said, had been the bedrock of advertising for pretty much since video advertising began, is now too long, too short, too complex, and too simple, which is a whole lot of contradictory things to be at the same time. Can you just walk me through that? Why does the 30 second video no longer work? So no one is so interested in the story that you have to tell as someone who is choosing to continue to watch it when they could skip at any time. And in our YouTube world, that's very explicit. There's a skip button that comes up after five seconds. And if your ad is 30 seconds long, that skip button has been there for 25 of those seconds. If I've chosen to watch 25 seconds, How long will I choose to watch and keep watching and keep watching and keep watching? Should I stitch another feature on? Should I stitch another story, another use case, another value proposition? There's no incremental cost to me, so I might as well. And we actually found that the top link for driving consideration and favorability is two to three minutes long. So definitely a 30 second ad is too short. On the other hand, the experience of being forced to watch a 30 second ad is so unpleasant that we had to get rid of it on our platform because the users hated it so much that it drove them off the platform, drove their phones back into their pockets. And they were so hostile to an experience that was out of their control for 30 whole seconds that it's too long. So too long, too short. Um, In some ways, it is too simple in that it doesn't allow for this uh, sorry, it's too complex in that it doesn't allow for modular rebuilding, like the narrative in a 30-second story. You can't swap out this and that and this and that and personalize it, make it about Sydney or make it about the suburbs when it's about the city and so on and so forth. So it is too complex to personalize. But the amount of information you need to convince us to change our heart or mind doesn't fit in 60 seconds. So it's too simple. And so this thing that we've built the business on, and and there are amazing 30-second ads, don't get me wrong, and I love them, they're incredible. But if you look from a human behavior out, if we're forced to watch, we we would prefer six seconds. So how do you do six-second storytelling? Well, and maybe you do two or three or four iterations of six seconds instead of one. But if we are interested, then two to three minutes is going to be much more effective than 30 seconds. And so we want shorter and longer because we want what we want. Uh, The theme of our presentation last year is the world is made of what you love. We want a world filled with what we love. And we love stories that we're interested in. We hate stories that we're not. And 30 seconds sits right in this, the the unsweet spot, we called it, the valley of despair. Too long, too short. And so is the ideal then that you have a two to three minute ad, the first six seconds of which are so compelling that I would choose to opt in? Is that kind of the, the... picture perfect world so uh so sort of yes Uh, if i am interested in changing your heart or mind if i'm interested in changing the trajectory of your opinion then an ideal is two to three minutes and it has a hook at the beginning that is so compelling that you watch long enough to be convinced may not be the whole thing Uh, that's another piece like we can't guarantee you get to the end and so we need a a 12 to 15 second chapter that has a whole proposition in it. And then if you like that, then the second chapter can be a little longer. So it runs from 20 to about 45 seconds. Then I've got you to 45 seconds. You'll probably watch, you know, most if you're interested. And so then I can slow down and open up the storytelling a little bit and go a little deeper. And then I need a big finish so that it's pulled together. So we've understood the architecture of that sort of longer form storytelling, but it's even better if you have a six second ad before you see that two to three minute ad, because then you'll watch it at a higher rate and you'll retain more of it. So better to have a six and then a two to three minute than two ver- two exposures to a two to three minute. And then you get a layer down into marketing objectives. And so if I want top of mind awareness, 
it would be better to have a lot of sixes and 15s and not a two to three minute. And again, if I'm that mid funnel consideration favorability, I want a long form and bottom of the funnel, I actually don't want to be convinced from scratch. I want confirmation and action. So the ads at the bottom of the funnel tend to get shorter again, more like 45 seconds or 30, 35, 40 seconds. You've, I've heard you mention before this, the, a third era that we're entering this kind of third era and third era of storytelling, third era of video advertising. And in this third era, and this is my language, it's the, the era of big stories and invitations. That was kind of how it went in for me. And I'm going to give you what I got from it and you can then pull that apart and say, that's not at all what I meant. Um, please do. So what I took from it was that we've got, you know, we've got automation and lead generation, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Trailers, you, you beautifully called them invitations, you know, trailers, short form stories that potentially put you into a lead generation sequence, which, you know, maybe take you somewhere else, ask you to download something, whatever it does. So we've got the automated side of it. Then we've got TV, which is again, less automated. But those stories, again, are considered to be invitations, all leading to a better understanding and telling of long form stories. So what you've called big stories. So everything that happens on TV, um, on our digital worlds, in the short form invitations are there to drive us to one big story or a few big stories. Now, firstly, did I get that right? And secondly, what are these big stories? Where are they housed? What do they look like? So yes, you did a good job. It very much looks like that. I think that I think that we have designed all these forms and formats, and every single one of them has their own justification. So I can tell you with third-party validated research why a six-second ad is powerful and a two-minute ad is powerful and 800 different variations of display formats. And that's gotten us to a space of untenable complexity. If you're a CMO, there are so many forms and formats, not just ours, but metas and TikToks and Twitters and so on. And so how do you make and how many things can you make? And much more of your time is consumed with making to match all these formats. This third era that we're coming into, the, the bottom of that, the small, the text and the image and display and the short form video, all that will be automated. You won't need to think about, is it this format or that format? It, it isn't now, but it soon will be good enough that you're just uploading a set of lines, uploading a set of images, and that library will self-optimize around audiences of interest at prices that make sense and according to signals that make sense. So when that whole world is organized and automated and you're stoking a library and managing it like a machine, then that frees up a ton of energy all of that automated world is never going to get you to buy something that you would not buy from scratch. In order to change your heart and mind, we need a big story, a long form story, which is going to require human storytelling. It won't be automated. And those are these beautiful long form stories like movie trailers. It is creator driven content where there is a human story at the middle. It is culturally driven because the cultural signals are very complex, won't be automated, or it's live. And those live experiences, particularly in APAC, are incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. Those won't be automated. So this tier of automation will feed into these big stories that are human created, and it will harvest attention out of them. So I will invite you to say, watch my two to three minute trailer about my smartphone or, or my home appliance or my washing detergent or whatever it is. And then when you get that big story and it tells a transformative emotional human story that changes your heart and mind and will be able to see that you watched it and maybe understand when you're gonna go shopping or when you're in market for this purchase and this, you know, again, automated chain is gonna surface up. Um, around you, choreograph around you the demand fulfillment. And it's going to say, how about this? How about the phone? You saw it, you liked it. Here's another feature, another feature, another feature. Here's a price, here's the discount until it has you pulled through in whatever way is going to be powerful for you to, to purchase. And I think, you know, that's the digital world and the TV world sits on top of that. But again, what's in the TV world? 15s and 30s. And so you can see already in the movie studios, how are they using a 30? They're doing a short trailer and the call to action, watch the full trailer on YouTube. 
They are inviting you into the story that you know takes the time, and that is migrating from the media entertainment world to the tech world. So Apple does the same thing. Whenever they launch a product, they have a long form film and the TV is an invitation and there's automated worlds and invitations. And it's migrating out from there into other brands. Luxury in particular has done a great job of this fashion, great job. Uh, and it was accelerated by COVID because we couldn't do fashion shows. And so uh, Gucci and all of these incredible luxury brands, they couldn't have a show. So they did either a live experience digitally or they did a long form video and they're beautiful. These incredible long form videos that function essentially as the entire catalog of the season. And then it breaks apart into fragments and it shows you, uh, you know, a piece of jewelry or shoes or a dress or whatever. And it closes down that funnel to purchase. And that whole world will feed off of the library that comes from that big story. You know, I love about that. I love that, you know, it almost feels kind of, full circle you know we've gone down digital rabbit holes not rabbit holes but that require human energy and human resources and budgets to manage and what we're doing is moving that into the realms of machine iteration basic automation and we're coming right back to you know the largest contribution that we can make as creators as thinkers as storytellers is the big long form you know, as you said, beautifully done, changing hearts and minds, like bringing our attention back to what we do well, what, what only we can do, which is heart-driven storytelling, long-form storytelling. I love the fact that it feels very full circle with that. What's, again, what are some examples of some of these big stories that you've seen do really well? I mean, Other than the, the four-hour ad is, is, you know, that's, that's a fairly massive story. <laughs> I mean, I think I think the examples that have come out in the last year that are really amazing. At Apple, I have to give credit to if you have seen, they have a series of B2B ads. So their B2B ad is eight minutes and 50 seconds long. And it's a story of these set of employees and they want to start their own business. And there are two, there are two versions. And it's as well cast as a feature film. And the action is great and it's hilarious and amazing. And, you know, it's beautifully shot and it's the story of them trying to make this product. And oh, by the way, they're using all of the elements of Apple's B2B business suite. And if you watch the movie, you'll get retargeted with a security feature and a collaboration feature and a mobility feature. And all of that is baked into the story in a way that is very seamless but also then they can harvest off of by retargeting in ways that draw you closer to the idea of Apple providing B2B. So amazing, amazing for them. Coach similarly has done amazing stuff. Puma has done amazing stuff. Puma did a series of nostalgic films that were featuring, uh, that were featuring Clyde, Walt Frazier, uh, and which is one of their iconic shoes. And you'd think like, oh, nostalgia must be for old people, but it actually worked incredibly well for young people. Uh, and, you know, they didn't have the association with him as a basketball player, which would have been in the 70s, um, but they just love the style and they love the story. And it's very interesting. Nostalgia is a super interesting topic right now because it showed up all over advertising. If you saw, for example, the Super Bowl ads, every other ad was nostalgia. And you're like, why is why are all these ads nostalgia? Well, the thing we need to realize is we're living in a cultural moment where all of culture is available to us. And so it used to be like nostalgia was a thing that I saw that disappeared. And when I see it again, I'm reminded of my youth. But culture is continuous for a generation where all culture is available on YouTube. And so if I see an ad for, for Walt Frazier, you know, I can go on YouTube and watch highlights of him playing today and his style and him showing up at nightclubs. And it's, it's all there for me. It's not lost. And so if I'm a young person, like all that style is available to me and all that taste and it isn't, it isn't captive and hidden in a specific era that needs to be evoked. So this idea of nostalgia, nostalgia is now and it's, and it's continuous. Um, one of the things that I think is just fascinating in this idea that this cultural moment is unique is that the bands that have hit a billion views on YouTube. So that's a sort of marker of if you a music video hits a billion views, that there's a certain cultural reach there, right? We can say, okay, makes sense. And the if you look at the top artists who have multiple billion view videos, they all make sense. You know, Jay Balvin and the Latin pop folks are huge. Justin Bieber, huge. Nicki Minaj, huge. Okay, go down a layer. K-pop, huge. Katy Perry, okay. You know, usual suspects are there. 
But then the Cranberry Zombie is a billion view video. And Cindy Lauper has a billion view video. And Coolio Gangster's Paradise has a billion views. And you're like, okay, but wait a second, you know, he died. And so then it came back on the air and it's there. And so that surges back into the popular imagination in a scaled way that is new. Um, and the latest billion view video I'm happy to share is a little known band with a hot new sound, The Police, Every Breath You Take, just hit a billion views on YouTube. And is that linked to, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Kate Bush went to number one again um, due to Stranger Things out of Netflix. I mean, a whole new generation discovered that song. It went back to went back to number one again. Is is the resurgence linked to popular culture in some way? As in, suddenly it's a, on a soundtrack that's that's current, or is it literally just something that moves back through the ether and gains momentum as it goes? Certainly, Kate Bush is that. Kate Bush appears in Stranger Things, and it sets fire. Her career takes off in an amazing and transformative way. Fantastic. God love her. Couldn't wish her more success. But also, you know, these these sort of smoldering ground fires of it's been around forever. Every Breath You Take did not resurface in a movie, did not resurface in an ad. Um, it just built back up and built back up. And these ephemeral communities, enough of them knit together, and it got surfaced. And it got to a billion views. So both of those things are happening. I want to. I want to just. I want to change tone. Just change gear for a little bit before we before we finish up today. And you know, you very kindly sent me a lot of links before our conversations. And this, I, that is the part I look forward to the most before you and I chat because I send you an email. I'm like, you know, what's new? Tell me about the experiments that you're running. Tell me about what you're doing. And I love seeing what comes back. Like sometimes it's these incredible videos. Sometimes it's a PowerPoint presentation that you've done. Um, and this time what came back was, was kind of the quality of what I would have expected. But then at the bottom of the email, there was a line and it said, you know, this is more personal than usual. Um, but I wrote this article for, for Medium and it's had incredible feedback. And it must have been about half past four in the afternoon, which usually I have to go and pick up the kids. And I clicked on it and I expected to kind of just scan it, have a quick look, and it completely stopped me in my tracks. And I must have read it five times, I think. And it was just the most beautifully written, um, heartfelt, powerful piece of, of, of writing. And, you know, to give everybody that's listening before I continue talking uh, an idea, it was called If Not Joy, Then Joy's Direction. And, you know, I'd love you in whatever way you feel comfortable and whatever way feels right to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about what it was, but what led you to writing it in the moments, the weeks, the months, whatever it, it was, led you to a place of, because that's a, that's a, a diversion for you in terms of the type of material that you usually create. And I think that's what made it so powerful for me. Mm. So, uh, so I was at a point in my life where I got laid off twice in a row. Uh, first one job and then a second job. And I had little kids, both under both under five years old in that span. And both times I lost my house. So the place where I was living the first time I couldn't afford it and I had to sell it. And the second time the job came with a house. Uh, and when I lost the job, I lost the house also. And so I was coming up out of this incredibly brutal time and my kids were struggling. I had a child with very considerable special needs and my marriage was crumbling and, and my younger child was, was far away from me. And so all of the things that, that I understood about the world were not there. I was not the father that I wanted to be and I was not the provider I needed to be. And I was, did not have a satisfying professional life. I just didn't know how life worked. Uh, and so I wrote this four line poem and it was a way for me of, of diagnosing what I could do that day. Uh, and, and so it starts at the most positive level. If not joy, then joy's direction. If I'm not happy today, what can I do that moves me in the direction of happiness? So well, what environments can I put myself into? What can I seek out? Can I buy a book that maybe at some future point I might enjoy? Can I can I go be with people, my friends, even though I'm going to show up and be cranky or depressed, but, you know, closer. So that's the best. That's the top. Uh, 
and and then the next layer down is not if not strength then the conditions for strength so if i don't have the ability to pursue joy's direction then at least feed the beast at least eat good food get sleep don't drink too much don't do these bad things that are going to further deplete you and so that at some point the human animal that is me is going to be able to move back in the direction of joy so that's the next that's the next layer that's the next layer down and like can you take care of yourself take care of yourself as best you can uh, and some point sometimes that's positive you know at this at this period of time like sometimes it was six o'clock at night and i was like just crawl into bed that's all you can do for today and at least the sleep is not a negative uh, and sometimes it's a you know don't drink like don't drink don't have another drink just you know that's enough stop now go to bed and and you know hopefully the day will pick up uh, the third layer down, if stasis movement, so if you're paralyzed, just change the energy, just move in a different direction. Uh, at this point, I was living in Boston, and I had a train commute in, and then I would take the subway to my office, and I stopped taking the subway, and I would walk from the train to the office, which was a considerable walk, and it was the middle of winter, it was freezing cold, but the shock of the cold air and being in a different environment and seeing different things and just like letting a different kind of light pass through my eyes like that changes your energy and it unlocks something maybe you can't see it and and maybe you don't feel it but it but it has the ability to change something so that was the third layer down um uh and the last layer is a paralysis forgiveness if you can't do any of those things and there were definitely days when none of those things were possible Find some way to forgive yourself. Find some way to say, like, did the best you could. Did the best you could. And maybe not today, but tomorrow. And so I would wake up every morning, and I would just check in. I'm like, where am I today? A joyous direction? Great. Like, let's do that. Okay, I can't do that. Maybe I can make some healthy choices. Maybe not. Uh, and, and it just let me see how bad bad was and what was going to be possible and set a kind of expectation. And then, you know, over a course of weeks and months, fewer days at the bottom, more days at the top, then some days you start to not check in, and you don't need to check in, like so you've got enough ground under you, and it's sort of then it's sort of faded, but I had it written down. And and over the years, I mean, I wrote it a bunch of years ago, I would have friends who were in, you know, hard situations, and I could see them, and I could see them over time, and I would say, hey, I wrote this, you know, here's a thing, if it's helpful, and uh, and it helped a bunch of people. And so two weeks ago, we had huge layoffs uh, here. And then my team was hit very hard. Um, a team I built from nothing. I mean, this whole shoot the ads on your credit card. You know, I built a global team and amazing, uh, super talented people. Uh, and a bunch of them very abruptly lost their jobs. And I knew what that felt like. And I knew what it was like to stare out the window with little kids and think like, what am I going to do next? Like, how does this picture work? And it was a Sunday after the Friday layoff, and I was feeling helpless. I had, you know, I'd lost my team and hadn't been able to defend them. And I was like, what can I do? And so I pulled it out and wrote it up and, and sent it out. And the response has been amazing. I mean, just incredible. I, people on my team and people in the Google layoff for sure, but friends of mine from college sending it to friends of theirs and notes from strangers. Uh, I mean, it's been the thousands of people. It's been really amazing. It's really amazing. I mean, for me, for me, for you to put that out there, a, a window into your a window into your experience and, and almost like a blueprint that you used that was helpful for you is it is leadership. You know, it's it's leadership at the, the highest level to to share something of myself that can help you shed some light on where on where you're going. Um I wanted to just pick up on the the forgiveness line. Because I read that line, that that final part, and you know we've I'm not going to say we've all been there. I hope we haven't all been there. Um, I hope there are many people that have not been there, but you <laughs> never go there. I, I hope you never go there. <laughs> but you know I, I certainly have and, <laughs> and have have visited that place probably multiple times, um, at least two times that I can you know very tangibly remember. And that line, um, if paralysis, forgiveness. And I just, the, the question that came into my head really strongly when I read that was, what does that sound like? You know, like you're in that place, you feel paralyzed, you're in fight or flight, 
you're not quite sure, you can't find Joe's direction, the idea of taking yourself to the gym rather than, you know, pouring yourself a glass of wine feels unthinkable. Um, what, what does forgiveness sound like? And it's going to sound different for everybody, but what does it sound like for you? I think it sounded like for me that a moment of surrender was okay. Uh, and so, you know, it was a moment of not being able to do anything, not being able to say anything, not be able to set myself in motion in any kind of way, not that, that sort of depleted down to nothingness and, and the ability to sit in that and say, that's all there is. That's all there is right now. And, you know, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person forever. I'm a bad dad forever. Or, I'll never have anything to contribute. That's the, you know, it's very easy to spin that self-loathing voice up. And it's very easy to say what's now is permanent. And I think the power of that line was to say, at least recognize today that that's not permanent. That you aren't going to be this way forever. That there's a chance you'll wake up tomorrow and you may be in the same, but it may be a little different. And, you know, maybe that's just a little bit of hope that comes in from mm -hmm. the forgiveness. That's what it looks like for me. I, I love where you, came, where you came from then. It wasn't a place of, you know, it's not my fault. I didn't, you know, do this. I completely resolved myself of any responsibility here. It's a place of, you know, enough for today. Enough. Like I allow myself grace for today, knowing that tomorrow may well be different. But that's, that's enough for today. Let me just take care of what I can take care of in this moment, which is my own sense of self and ability to start the next day, hopefully with a sense of hope that it might be different. Something different might happen. Um, well, thank you. I mean, we are, we are bang, bang on the dot right now. And as many questions as I have here as we haven't covered, um, I know that you'll be back again. So Ben, <laughs> with, you know, some of the rest of your experiments and some crazy weather conditions to, to throw into the loop. Thank you, Ben. You just, you know, this part of the year talking to you is one of my favorite parts of the podcast. So thank you for coming back. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. I can't believe that felt like it was about eight minutes and like we're at an hour. So it was a treat. Always a treat to see you. And, and I guess we'll see you next year probably. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea, or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea, or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.